So this first hour is Flux and Helm uh, intro and maybe how to teach it to your teams. So take it away, Stefan. Thank you, Sal. Hey folks, I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, I didn't, I didn't think I would ever say that, but I have like, uh, uh, I miss the conferences. I have a t-shirt with DockerCon San Francisco a long time ago, two years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully next year conferences are back. So um, until then we'll meet online. So now I share my screen. Okay. So in this first part, I'm going to talk about continuous delivery and how we can get to applying GitOps <laughs> to achieve uh, this type of uh, procedure. So to start with, um, let's think about um, classic typical uh, CI/CD pipeline that most of us are, are using when we, let's say, get started with Kubernetes or um, even further down the line. So assuming we have an application repository, everything is in there, our source code, uh, our Docker file, um, our Kubernetes manifests, and of course, some scripts or um, maybe some um, workflow, I don't know, YAML workflow for GitHub Actions or uh, Jenkins YAML or stuff like that, that can drive the whole CACD process. So what I'm trying to show here is, uh, is a one, uh, one workflow that does everything. Uh, it, let's say tests, run the unit tests. Uh, it uses the Docker file to build uh, your app image. Uh, it pushes that image to um, Docker registry or on-prem container registry. And afterwards, um, what the script does, it replaces the um, image tag with, let's say, set or customized set image or anything that can replace a string in a, in a YAML file. So it does that replacement and then applies the whole thing on the cluster. And this is a, a valid um, workflow, right? You, change something in your code, then uh, the image gets deployed, then you apply it to Kubernetes, then you can, let's say, wait for the deployment to roll out. And here it is. This is how you can eat uh, on your cluster. Now, there are a couple of issues with, with this all-in-one uh, workflow. Um, I listed some, some of them here, the challenges. Um, my colleagues and other, um, others have talked before me about what are the challenges when CACD is managed in a, by a single server, a single agent that does everything. Um, some challenges are around traceability. So let's suppose um, you push commits to the master branch in parallel. Um, more than one team member does this uh, uh, git push at the same time. So uh, you'll have a couple of CI jobs running the whole thing. So how can you know what will be deployed on the cluster? Um, let's say CI is unpredictable, right? You can have a job that's running in one minute or you have a, the same job could run in 10 minutes. So uh, one way to make sure that only the last commit gets deployed on the cluster means that you have to serialize your, your CI pipeline. And that's quite bad because you will be losing on uh, precious time, right? It, uh, all these commits will pile up and you have like all these kind of jobs that maybe they will cancel one each other and so on. So, and when you replace um, <clears throat> the Docker image in a YAML file, you lose that information because it's there in, in your CI logs. So if you want to see was the last thing that got deployed on my cluster. If you look at Git, you cannot see it. You have either you have to query the cluster, so you have to connect to it and um, uh, do a get deployment, grab by image and see what image is running there, or you can uh, search through the CI logs. 
So that's that's one big challenge. Um, from a security point of view, here in your CI/CD platform, you have to keep the credentials to your cluster. That means your cluster must be exposed. Um, let's say if you are using a SaaS platform, uh, you have to expose your Kubernetes API on the on the public internet, so that SaaS can connect to it. Of course, you can whitelist the IPs and do all all sorts of stuff. Uh, but the idea is that your CI agent has the keys to the kingdom because it has to create deployments, namespaces, and everything that makes up your, uh, your app. That means it has cluster-wide access. So if someone hacks your, uh, your CI system in some way, then it also has, <clears throat> not only has access to your Docker registry, so it can push whatever image it wants, it can also exec into your um, production cluster and do all sorts of stuff. Um, it's a good practice to enable uh, two-factor authentication on, on Kubernetes API. Um, and it's quite easy to do that if you use uh, Kubernetes as a service from, I don't know, EKS, GKE, Azure, uh, all those options out there allow you to enforce two-factor authentication. But if you are doing this kind of uh, deployments, then you need to bypass it. So you have to create some iron roll that, you know, it's outside of uh, two-factor authentication. And that could be uh, quite challenging. Also from, um, from the disaster recovery perspective, let's say you have many app repos, not just one. How do you, let's say your cluster explodes, <laughs> you create a new one, how do you redeploy all, all those apps uh, on the class, cluster. Well, to do that, you have to rerun all the jobs, the CA jobs. That means you'll be creating a new Docker image, you push that image, and afterwards you apply it on the cluster. But that doesn't actually mean you are restoring the previous state. It's a new image, so maybe something changed. Uh, in any way, it's very hard to restore the state of your cluster when you have all these uh, CI jobs coupled with the, with the deployment uh, procedure. So how we can fix some of these things? Um, we break up CI from CD. Like it's, a, it's a simple thing you can do. Um, don't have to change much. Uh, your CI uh, pipeline or your CI uh, workflow uh, we'll just push the image uh, to the Docker registry and that's where uh, its, its role ends. So uh, we make CI, we simplify CI and we, we take the, uh, the deploy part from it. Now your CI platform af after it pushes that image and it knows what image tag it, it has pushed, it can write back that, um, that information to Git, let's say in a different branch it can do the same replace in the manifest, but will only do the replace in the manifest, and that's it. Then you define a new work, a new pipeline um, that's dedicated for continuous delivery, uh, and that pipeline will be kicked off by the same process, a webhook, let's say. Something changes in the manifests, in the branch where the manifests are, um, the CD platform uh, kicks off, uh, and let's say it validates that YAML, maybe it does a customized build, maybe it does a Helm install or whatever, and it delivers that those changes to the cluster. Now, <clears throat> what that means is that now the CI server doesn't have to be connected to your production cluster. Now you have this new entity, the CD platform, um, a CD agent that could be different, could be running on some, I don't know, a more secure place. And that agent will do the actual, the actual deploy. So this is, let's say, a step further in improving our um, CI CD pipeline. There are also challenges with, with this approach. Let's say you don't have a single app repository, you don't have this monolithic approach, you don't have a monorepo where everything is. Let's say you 
have a couple of app repositories, maybe you are doing uh, microservices so they can be deployed independently. Um, now your CD platform will be reacting to changes in let's say both repositories, right? So when you change something in your application, let's say the front end app, the CD platform deploys that. When you change something in your um, backend app, also deploys that. But let's say these two applications, these two microservices that are part of the same application, they have things in common, like they both get deployed in the same namespace. Um, they need an ingress controller and an ingress definition. Maybe they share secrets, like they both connect to the same database or they need some API token. Where do you place all these <clears throat> shared resources? Let's say you can duplicate, duplicate them and the namespace definition will also be in app one repository and in app two repository. So it doesn't matter which one you deploy first, the namespace gets applied. Um, what about the ingress controller? You need to install an ingress controller, let's say, let's say Contour or Nginx. Where are you going to put all those definitions? You're going to bootstrap your whole infrastructure from all these app repositories. That means you are going to duplicate all that. And if they go out of sync, maybe app one will install Nginx some version and app two will want to install some other version. So, you know, your, your ingress control restart and so on. So when doing CD from outside the cluster with uh, separate repositories, we, we have this challenge of how do we, ma we manage uh, shared resources. How can we improve this procedure? Like one way to um, have some sanity in deploying infrastructure items is to consolidate them in a single repository. Let's say um, you have a platform team in your organization and they're responsible for um, delivering Kubernetes as a service to every other engineering team, right? Um, the platform team will be managing namespaces, policies, uh, all the controllers that get deployed, what kind of ingress, what version, does it have a CV or not? All these uh, um, things could be owned by a dedicated team. And this team can place all these infrastructure manifests in a repository that's not an app repository. We, we refer to this as the cluster repository. Now, uh, the app developers, the engineering team can also place um, the, only the manifests that represents uh, their application in the same repository. So all these teams can collaborate with each other uh, over this cluster repository. And this gives us um, a couple of advantages. One is, let's say me as an app developer, I want to fine tune something in the ingress controller. So I'm I need to change some, uh, some things uh, in Nginx, let's say. Now, instead of doing this directly on the cluster, let's say you cut or apply or um, doing this in my own app repository, I can open a pull request on the cluster repository, have the platform team review my change, maybe test it in a different, uh, on a different cluster and afterwards merge it and approve it. Uh, approve it and, and merge it. Um, so having this single source of truth allows uh, multiple teams to collaborate on how, uh, how they want to change and how they want to drive operations on the cluster side. Uh, another advantage of, of having this cluster repo is around static analysis. Before all these manifests are delivered to the cluster, we can do a bunch of things with them before they get committed in a pull request. For example, um, we can run kubeval on all our YAMLs and see, hey, are my YAMLs uh, okay? Are they going to be applied on Kubernetes or they will error out because I don't, I've misspelled or I, I mistyped something in a, in a file. Um, and there are more advanced use cases of static analysis and um, a great example is um, 
conf test. I don't know if you've heard about this project. It has recently joined um, the open policy agent um, organization and it's a tool written by Gareth. So with conf test, <clears throat> you can integrate in your, in your CI pipeline, all sorts of uh, policy checks. Um, and I'll just give you the simple example here. Uh, for example, if, you, if someone tries to add a deployment that has a container that runs as root, then we can block that operation at the pull request level because we can compose such a, um, uh, a policy that will uh, look for the run as uh, non root and you know tell the user right from that pull request, hey, it's something wrong with your manifest before they reach the cluster or anything else. So, and you can do lots and lots of things with uh, with the with the rego language and. Um, improve your uh, workloads around creating this manifest before they reach the cluster. Um, once you have this single source of truth, you can also, um, you also get audit log by, by default. You don't have to do anything. You just have to type git history and you can see all the changes that are made uh, on your infrastructure and on your app definitions. Um, and for example, if you use Flux, you can also uh, ensure that whoever changes something in your uh, source of truth is an authorized uh, person, is an authorized committer. And you can do that by signing commits and telling the reconciler to check those signatures. Are these committers allow to change the cluster state or not. And this is done with PGP keys and commit signing. And it's a thing that um, most um, um, Git implementations support. Um, GitHub supports it, GitLab and so on. So it's quite uh, easy to you know, enforce this policy of everything it signed and afterwards um, use that information inside the cluster to authorize changes or not. And this helps a lot with um, defending against someone stealing your um, Git credentials, right? Because once you have this single source of truth, if someone can do a commit into the master branch, for example, that change will be deployed on the cluster. So uh, if someone steals your GitHub credentials, they can do that commit. But if they don't sign the commit with your private PGP key, then um, that change, even if it made it into the cluster, into the uh, Git repository, it will not be applied on the cluster. So um, here are some uh, advantages around uh, security. Also rollback. So let's say you change something, uh, you can do a Git revert if, if that change fails. Uh, and of course you reduce the mean time to recovery. And I'll, I'll talk about that later on. So once we have this single source of truth, uh, let's say this cluster repository where we define how, our, how the cluster should look like, what things should be running and uh, under which configuration, uh, then we can use a concept as cluster reconciliation. So if you want to have this repository that is the desired state of your cluster, how you can make your cluster fit that state. Um, and to have a cluster uh, reconciliation process, you need a couple of things. You need a Git repository, of course. You need a container registry where all the images that are pushed there are immutable. So if you are using, let's say, the latest tag, then that's not something that can represent a change. So it will not work with, with things like that. You need immutable images and the tags should be unique every time you push them. And the operations that the cluster re reconciler should do is quite simple. You should watch for changes in the repository by doing a git pull, let's say on a fixed interval or um, being triggered by a webhook if you want. 
it should detect config drifts and correct them. Let's say someone accepts into your cluster, changes something that doesn't match the, the thing that you described in Git. Let's say in Git you have two replicas, someone goes in there, does a uh, edit of the deployment and bumps the replica to 10. Um, the reconciler will detect this drift and should be able to undo it. Of course, there are changes that cannot be undone and the, and the reconciler should alert on, on uh, drifts that are, are not are not possible to be corrected. Um, should alert on misconfiguration and yeah, what I've talked before about uh, validating the uh, committer identity. So how do we get from this, well, the C CD platform running from outside being controlled by webhooks, how we get to running all things from inside? <clears throat> So if we, instead of a CD platform of a CD uh, job runner, we switch to using controllers, um, then we can run the CD process from inside the cluster. And a lot of people are saying like, what's the difference? I mean, I can run it from outside, from inside is the same, uh, is the same thing. Um, one of the main advantages of running the controllers inside the cluster is the fact that those controllers can be part of your cluster bootstrap. So let's say if you, if you want to add a new environment to your, um, for your application, you want to create a new cluster. If you run the, uh, the CD pipeline from outside, then after you create that cluster, you have to get the certificates, the secrets, you have to go into your CD platform, add those secrets there, uh, make some changes to the deployment script and only afterwards your um, CD pipeline will be aware, oh, there is a new cluster I also have to deploy here. Running these controllers from inside the cluster and um, running uh, integrating uh, the controllers bootstrap as part of your cluster creation means that when a cluster gets created, it knows where its desired state is and can synchronize immediately. So uh, instead of creating a cluster, going back and change the workflow or the script, with this approach, you can um, create clusters and those clusters will self reconcile. Uh, and that's a great advantage if you if you don't run like a single cluster with many namespaces, but if you run every environment is a different cluster or maybe some apps running a dedicated cluster, some other apps running their own cluster and so on. If you bundle these clusters together, it's hard. the more clusters you have, the harder it will be to manage them from a, from a external um, thing like, I don't know, a SaaS product, like GitHub Actions. So for GitHub Actions, you will have to create all these secrets uh, for each new cluster. Now, how can we how can we do this change of running things inside the cluster? There are a couple of established solutions uh, for doing this. Um, there is the FluxCD organization that's part of CNCF, and inside FluxCD there are two uh, projects. One is Flux, and one is the Helm operator. Uh, I'll be demoing uh, those two today. Uh, also in CNCF, it's Argo CD, and in CDF is Jenkins X. So these are the solutions that uh, are known to work nicely with this uh, pattern and have all, uh, all things sorted out, let's say. <clears throat> and here is a, a link to, uh, to the container solution blog where they, uh, they wrote a nice article on a comparison of these three solutions and what is the right uh, tool for you to pick up. I'm going to ask Lee to, mm -hmm. you know, have his own opinion on what, I, what I've just said. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. It's a really a fantastic walkthrough. I think if somebody's looking for an understanding of the difference between continuous integration and continuous delivery and deployment, uh, your first couple of slides, how you discussed it, 
paints that picture of how to decouple those systems. It's a great discussion in the Slack channel. And if you wanted to explain that value of decoupling integration and deployment to your team, I think talking about the problems of conflating those when those things run together, about like not being able to roll back without building your software, which on some teams might take like half an hour. You know, that is a, a key value in decoupling those things. And then you talk about this idea of then running the reconciler, but constantly having a controller apply the continuously deployed state in a continuous operations way inside the cluster. That goes back to what Cornelio was talking about, right? That if we can take that GitOps runtime and we can put it into the cluster in a pull based workflow really simplifies the mental model of how you operate on things. You're no longer like having to click, you know, when I like, oh, I brought down the cluster, made a new one. You're like now it's self-reconciling. And that's a huge value point to express to your team. You, know? you uh, planning to, to do a little demo now? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to say that um, you can easily build uh, some bootstrap procedure that bundles the CD controllers inside. We, we've done that with uh, EKS Scuttle, for example. Uh, we, yes. EKS yeah. Scuttle uses the Flux install package. So what we are going to release next is um, inside the EKS Scuttle config file where you define, hey, here is how mm -hmm. my cluster should look like. In there, you will be able to specify a Git repository. And when yeah. you do create cluster, you get an EKS cluster and then Flux will be installed there, will be pointing to the repository you just specified with your uh, SSH key uh, and it will self-reconcile uh, right after the bootstrap. So, yeah, that's a super something... exciting feature. Because yeah. you, then you can immediately see, right? I have the Git repo declaratively in my cluster's API definition. I just make the cluster and it's self-reconciling. And then that helps you make that conclusion. It's like, you could show your boss, look, I can delete our company's infrastructure and it's back up in 15 minutes. One step, yeah. amazing. Yeah, now, well, it works if you use some kind of database as a service. If you run mm -hmm. the database inside your cluster and you delete that cluster, then you lose all the uh, volumes and your data is gone. So. Yeah, GitOps was great in disaster recovery situations where all those workloads that are running there don't rely on the storage of the nodes. Like if you write on the nodes directly uh, or you use uh, some kind of volume um, defining Kubernetes and you delete everything, you also delete those volumes, then it's all gone. Um, but if you use uh, an external data source, it's quite easy to restore the whole state using, um, I don't know, bootstrap script that um, bundles the controller, the GitOps controller with it. Um, okay, so I'm going to, to show you how Flux works. Um, Flux does this very simple thing. You tell it where your Git cluster Git repo is and it applies it on the cluster and it does that on a on a fixed interval you can also tell flux hey synchronize it now it has a cli uh, and that's one part of what flux does and uh, there is another part of what flux uh, can do is it can monitor your uh, docker registry and it can do that image tag replace for you by committing back to git um, you can install Flux with uh, Flux ETL, or uh, you can use uh, our Helm uh, chart, or you can use Customize. Uh, we have documentation for all these uh, install processes. The idea is very simple that you give it um, the Git URL, a branch, and that's it. Flux takes over from there. I'm going to show you how this works. Uh, 
Okay. Think this is too big. Can you see? It's okay. Okay. So I have a, a repository where I have a lot of YAMLs inside that repository, of course. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do is uh, install Istio on a EKS cluster. So I have a cluster right here. Two nodes. It's nothing on it, just default um, namespaces. And I have my um, my cluster repository on GitHub. It's a public repository, so I don't need any kind of authentication to hook this uh, repo. And here inside the, the repository, I have a directory called Istio. And inside there are two things. One is the um, Istio operator manifests. And the other directory contains a namespace definition. Um, that creates uh, the Istio system namespace. And then I have a custom resource definition called um, <clears throat> uh, of kind Istio operator that tells the Istio operator how I want to, how I want Istio to be configured on my cluster. So I'm going to use Flux as the delivery mechanism of these definitions. And I'm going to use the Istio operator to actuate Istio itself to install it on my cluster and uh, spin it up with, uh, uh, with the default configuration. And I, here I also changed some things from the default. I'm dropping down the requests via memory so I can run it easily on, on a kind cluster, for example, on my laptop. So let's see how I can, how I can do this, get from this directory to something running on my cluster. Um, so what I'm going to do first, I'm going to create a namespace for Flux. Then I'm going to use Helm v3, so it doesn't need any kind of server side thing, no tiller, no nothing. And <clears throat> I'm going to install Flux, and I'm going to tell Flux where my uh, Git repository is. What branch I want it synchronized is the mm. uh, GitOps days branch and what path. So I have a lot, lots of things in this repository, but for now I'm only interested in uh, reconciling a part of this repository. So Flux has this capability where you can tell it, okay, here is the repository and branch, but only synchronize things in this path. Um, and I'm, I'm setting Flux here in read-only mode. So I don't have to authorize Flux uh, in any way in, in GitHub. Being a public repository, if Flux is in read-only mode, it can synchronize with repositories that you don't own, like this one, for example. And I'm enabling garbage collection. What garbage collection means in Flux terms, um, if you have something in your Git repository, let's say a deployment manifest, that gets applied on the cluster. And later on, you delete that file, that manifest from your Git repository, Flux will detect that, okay, before it was a deployment manifest, now it isn't. So I'm going to delete uh, the one that got removed from Git. So it's not all, only about synchronizing create and update operations, but also synchronizing delete operations. Okay, so I'm going to install Flux. Mm -hmm. so, so this is installing a service mesh. It's syncing up to the control repo and it's going oh. to do networking things for us, Stefan. Well, this is the EKS cluster. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think I know what's going on. Okay, so let's let's debug this. Um, so I've been installing Flux before on this cluster and um, There are some things that uh, Helm didn't uh, delete, like cluster roles. 
Okay, so there is a cluster role and cluster role binding. Okay, going to do going to change the name of the helm uh, stall. Going to say flux dev, so to not uh, collide with uh, objects that I forgot to delete from my cluster. I'm gonna take this opportunity to do a live demo ritual um, since we've already run into some snafus. So, okay, so Flux is now installed. Um, if I do get namespaces, I'm seeing that two new namespaces, namespaces were created: Istio operator and Istio system. These two namespaces are in my Git repository. So this is what Flux created. Now let's look inside uh, Istio system namespace and get the pods. So what I'm seeing now that uh, Istio has been installed along with Prometheus and uh, also installed the ingress gateway. These workloads are not provisioned by Flux. Flux has the intention for this workloads to be provisioned and that's what gets applied on the cluster. So it's a big difference between what's actually running on the cluster and the desired state, right? The desired state is more about, it's an intent, uh, more and like that, that you can That intent think is about. the Helm release, right, Stefan? What? So the, the Helm release custom resource, am I understanding you? No, um, I, I'm not using Helm operator. I didn't get to that part um, yet. Uh, what's What's, what's happening here is the fact that in my Git repository, I have, a, I have a custom resource called uh, Istio default that tells uh, the okay. Istio operator, hey, install Istio with the default profile for me. And okay, thanks. the result of that is all these pods, um, 30 something custom resources definition and everything that this still brings with. Right. So in my case, the desired state is more about, hey, I would like Istio to be installed with the default profile. Flux creates the Istio operator, then it adds this uh, intent, hey, I want, I want you to install uh, Istio in the Istio uh, system namespace and with this configuration, and then that operator creates all these objects. Um, so why, why I'm showing this use case is just to, to give the idea that desired state is not something very precise. It's more about the intent than actually what's wrong. So it's, uh, it's not all green. Okay. So Flux can apply things and synchronize uh, things from, from the Git repository. Um, another project we have under the Flux CD organization is, uh, is Helm Operator. And what Helm Operator does, it's a, it's a CRD controller. It can be controlled using a custom resource uh, type Helm release, where you can define, you can point to a Helm chart and tell Helm operator, hey, I want this Helm chart to be installed on the cluster. I want you to create a release for me with all these settings, all right? <clears throat> so how, <clears throat> how it works in combination with Flux, the Helm release manifest will be placed in the cluster repository as a file. Flux will synchronize that uh, Helm release on the cluster. Helm operator will detect, hey, it's a new Helm release. I have to do something with it. I either have to install it, upgrade it, or if the Helm release was deleted from Git, then the Helm operator uninstall will delete the, the release that's running in my cluster. So basically it makes Helm release uh, fit the declarative model of GitOps. So instead of running Helm commands, I'm just adding files to a Git repository. I'm modifying the files there and uh, the Helm operations like install, upgrade, delete, wait, and so on are performed by an operator uh, for me. How a Helm release looks like? It's, uh, it's composed uh, out of um, 
several um, regions. Uh, one is the chart specification. So with the Helm release, you can reference charts from Helm repositories and you can tell Helm operator, hey, here is the repository URL, uh, the name of the chart and the version that needs to be installed. And once you place this uh, definition in Git, Flux synchronize it. And in this case, it will install, into, it will install the seal secrets controller uh, in a cluster. So this is how you can reference, let's say, uh, charts from um, Helm, re uh, Helm repositories, which are in fact um, an HTTP server serving some tarballs. And you it also, also works with private yeah. uh, chat repositories. You can, uh, you can configure Helm operator with tokens and with username, password, basic authentication and so on. So it could also connect to your private uh, repositories. Um, now, Helm operator, if we just look at this, Helm operator has nothing to do with GitOps, right? It connects to a file server, it downloads a tar, and it installs that. Helm operator has also the um, possibility to connect to Git repositories, right? So um, instead of saying, hey, my chart is in a Helm repository, my chart can be in a Git repository. You give it a Git repo URL. You tell it where the chart is inside your Git repository and what branch should be uh, the one used to, to take, take the chart. So basically the Helm operator connects to the Git repository like Flux. It does a, um, a Git clone. Um, it gets the, the chart uh, and uses the values that you can specify here uh, inside the Helm release to install it on the cluster. So, Having this in mind, like if we go back to the cluster repository idea, like I've seen people having issues with, hey, I'm going to place all my apps definition inside the single repo. And um, some companies told me, hey, this, this doesn't work for us. We are like 100 things. We cannot share the same repository. It's like too much. Um, if let's say your application is bundled as a Helm chart, right? In here, in the cluster repository, you don't have to add all your apps manifests. You just add a reference to those manifests and those manifests can be in a Helm repository. Uh, and I don't know the CI pipeline for each application publishes uh, a new Helm chart to that repository or here you can uh, link to the actual app repository itself on a, let's say, a release branch where the chart is. So the idea of defining a, a single source of truth is not only about, hey, let's put here every single YAML we have uh, that makes the cluster. It's about defining here the intention of how your cluster should be. And that can be through pointers. Okay, I'm pointing towards a, a, a Helm chart. Now, the same thing applies to customize. Helm um, Flux can um, run customize, apply uh, the result of a, a customized build on your cluster. So imagine here in your cluster repository, instead of adding all the apps manifest, you can add the customization YAML that references the base in your app repo, right? So when Flux will do a customized build, it will pull all the manifests from all these repositories uh, in, in its local container and, and it will apply that. So there are ways to, you know, um, if, if this approach doesn't, doesn't fit your company because maybe you have many, many engineering teams, uh, then using Helm to bundle your app or using something like a customized base um, can, can be uh, a, different, a different solution. Okay, so we were here, um, Helm operator using a Git source. This is what I was talking about. Your cluster repository can have, let's say, only namespace definition and Helm releases. 
right? Because um, uh, Helm v3, for example, not create namespaces for you. So you need something that creates those namespaces and that can be flux. Also, you need something that applies these Helm resources on your cluster. And that's also flux looking at the, at the cluster Git repository. From there, Helm operator takes off, can connect to other Git repositories where your, actually, your actual charts are and install them as a Helm release. I'm going to show you how this can be done. So if I'm going back to my cluster repo, I've installed Istio, it's only for plain YAMLs. Let's say now I want to install Flagger, which is an operator that um, orchestrates uh, deployments with Istio. Istio is one, one option. So I want to install Flagger for Istio. How can I do that? Uh, one option will be I can copy all Flagger manifests inside this repository. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to use uh, the Flagger uh, Helm repository, which is hosted at flagger.app. And I'm going to install a specific version and I'm going to configure Flagger for my cluster. And I'm going to say, tell Flagger, hey, the provider is Istio and the metric server is here in the Istio system. So how can I, how can I deploy uh, Flagger using this file? Um, first, I'll have to install Helm operator. using Helm <laughs> and here I'm, I'm telling Helm operator to use V3 as a version. So it will not look for tiller uh, or not anything like that. You can also tell Helm operator to use the same SSH secret as Flux. So Flux, when you install Flux, it generates an SSH um, uh, key and you can use the, the public key for that as a, uh, as a deployment key in GitHub or GitLab and so on. If you want Helm operator to connect to the same repository, maybe there you also store your charts. When you install Helm operator, you can tell it, hey, use the uh, the SSH secret that Flux created. And this is how they can share the same uh, Git repository, the same authentication scheme. Is taking too long? <clears throat> he guess he's slow. <laughs> okay. Looks like uh, cannot pull the image from um, from Docker Hub. I don't know what I'm doing. Watch doesn't trace aliases. Yeah, that one gets me. Okay. Oh yeah, I know what's going on. Maybe it's called flux dev get to play because you yeah, changed the I'm going to delete this one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hopefully this time works. It's kind of a classic thing where it's like, oh, you just assume it can't pull the image and then you start blaming the cloud when it was actually your typo all along. Yeah. Failed to mount the well, yeah. describe is, is always the solution, right? 
Okay. Yeah. So if I'm looking at what's running in the Flux namespace, now I also have Helm operator running. Great. Um, what I'm going to do now is tell Flux to also synchronize the flag of that directory. So I'm keeping Istio. I want that uh, to be reconciled, but I'm also adding, um, well, this is not going to work because I have to do this. Okay. So I'm going to add a new path um, flagger. Copy paste problems like always. Okay, so now I'm changing the flux configuration and I'm telling it to expand to um, to include also the, the flagger directory. And inside this directory, there are a couple of things. I have the helm release. I have another helm release that installs uh, the Grafana dashboard for flagger. Um, metrics and is still gateway and all things flagger needs. So if I'm looking at this still system for the pods, I'm seeing that flagger is running, Grafana is installed. And if I'm doing, uh, looking at the metrics, custom metrics, I see that there are two custom metrics, declared error rate and latency. And these are uh, things uh, that Flagger needs to, uh, to measure um, the progressive rollouts uh, success or not. I'm going to talk that uh, later about that. So now if I'm, if I'm going here, and I'm going to change the version um what helm operator will do so helm operator now has detected okay there is a helm release that has installed um we can do this your system get helm release and what we see here is there are two releases installed we can do the same thing with helm um so this one has been installed. If I'm changing something and I uh, I wait for Flux to, to do this kind of synchronization, Helm operator will do an upgrade. Um, let me try and change it. Let's see what, what else can break. Um, Going to do a helm search for flagger. The latest version is 0 0.27. Going here, going to change the new version. Going to commit the changes. And now what happens? I've, I've set flux to pull from Git every minute. But if I don't want to wait for, uh, for Flux to pull it, I can use uh, Flux CTL sync. And Flux CTL sync should um, tell Flux, hey, synchronize it now. I I'm guessing this was already done. And here this stuff. And let's see what happened to, to the flagger um, and release. Nothing yet. So also time operator has its own um, loop where um, it does the installation. So it could take some, uh, some time before it does it. But 
The idea is all these reconcilers are having their own internal clocks. So they will be synchronizing things um, at a fixed interval. So it's not, if you, if you want to hook everything to, uh, to Git events, then you need to set up webhooks. And um, there is a project in Flux the organization called Flux Receiver, when you can use this receiver and um, expose it through an ingress controller and link it to GitHub or GitLab or Docker registries. So um, Flux will be notified when you do a Git commit and then it will uh, synchronize the, that commit instantly. Maybe something is, uh, is wrong with my... Uh, with this version. Okay, it has upgraded. It. So it's revision two, and I'm now using uh, 0 0.27. So it had applied uh, the changes. It took about one minute. So this is a short demo of what these two tools can, how these tools can be put together and build your clusters using Git. And not only uh, plain manifest, but also combining plain manifest with Helm releases. And there is also um, an example in the Flux CD organization, how you can um, combine customize into all of this. Um, the idea is if you have multiple environments, maybe you want to change things between them and you have a couple of choices here. You, every environment can be a um, kit branch, for example. So you can have a dev branch, a staging branch, a production branch, and you can merge from one to another. Um, that's one approach. Another approach will be to have directories inside the master branch for each environment. But let's say you go with the directory approach. We at WeWorks we do it like that. Um, the problem is you have a lot of duplications between those directories. Like maybe from development to staging, the differences are very small. Maybe the limits are different. Maybe the horizontal pod of a scalar max and min are different. Um, the ingress DNS is uh, host names are definitely different. So instead of just copy pasting all these manifests in, into these directories, um, you can use customized overlays and just change those things that differ from one environment to the other. And then you tell Flux, hey, synchronize this directory using this customization YAML and um, it will apply that customization on, on your cluster. So that was the Flux demo and have an operator. Excellent. Thank you so much.